Good morning and welcome to church. We have a few different things going on today. Chief among them is that Ed Suter is preaching for us again today. Uh, Ed has so many connections here. It's like half the people know him from since he was a baby. So we're uh, just glad to have him back. Um, I just have a few announcements. Uh, do um, take a look at summer camp registration and hurry up and sign up if you're going to. We've had a huge number of registrations already and we want to make sure that all of our church family regulars that get in there with a can. Um, we have the Lenten special offerings, one for Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, which steps in. They have places ready to go in all parts of the world. And so it's one of the fastest and most efficient ways that you can get your funds to places in need. Uh, also, we're still asking for a little extra money, if you have it, to help for the cost of the repairs of the gas leak we had in January which was some $24,000, which is not in the budget, obviously. Um, the clothing collection for Lent, the socks and underwear is going very well. And if you look at the uh, piled high wagon out in the uh, coat room area, we're doing well, but we can always use more. Uh, the, we're asking for food for Easter food boxes, and the de deadline for that is this Friday, the 22nd. So please make your contributions either in the, in the offering plate today or bringing something by church this week. We're still looking for volunteers for the Easter egg hunt. We can use as many people as we can get in all kinds of capacities. And if you are interested in going to the production of Daniel at the Sight and Sound Theater in July, please make sure you get signed up before April 15th. Um, we need to have your signature and your funds by that time. Now, let us worship God. Good morning. Please rise and join me in the call to worship. With the words printed in your bulletin, let us worship God for whom our souls thirst and our bodies long. Listen, listen to me, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. We have come to hear the word God has sent. God's word will not return empty but will accomplish through us his holy purpose. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Then we will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will sing. The trees of the field will clap their hands.
Please be seated. God's word assures us, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin, followed by a time of silence. God of compassion, you are slow to anger and full of mercy, welcoming sinners who return to you with penitent hearts. Receive in your loving embrace all who come home to you. Seat them at your bountiful table of grace, that with all your children they may feast with delight on all that satisfies the hungry heart. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Alleluia. Amen. And now that we are reconciled and at peace with God, let us be at peace with one another. Peace be to you. Lord God, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Genesis, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very Good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. The word of the Lord.
Amen, and good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be here with you all. Our New Testament lesson for this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. Let's say this. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't see any children here this morning, so let's all join together and pray for all of us. Dear God, we come before you today to pray for the children in our lives. Please give us ears to hear eyes to see, and insight to know just what they need to thrive and grow. Help us to be strong nurturers to guide them, love them, and teach them all about you. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, thanks for having me here. Again, uh, as Ann mentioned, this is much like a homecoming, it was just a few months ago. I was I was here and able to speak, but uh, I, I, my, much of my family uh, is connected to the church. Uh, the, the Beck family, Jen Beck is my my sister, my nephews Andy and Owen, my brother-in-law Jason. Uh, my wife grew up in this church. Elise Woomer and her parents are still members here, uh, and I began coming here when I was in middle school or high school. Uh, in that range. So it's, it's really, really good to be back here. I worked uh, at Westminster Presbyterian Church with Jason, uh, your pastor, for, for about 13 years uh, until very recently. Uh, and, and now I work as a, a mental health counselor uh, at Waynesburg University, working with the college students there uh, and working with the students and the faculty as a mental health resource on campus at, at Waynesburg. So uh, it's, it's a delight. I've realized uh, stepping away from some of the vocational ministry, uh, much of what I've missed, so it's a delight to be able to be here to speak and share uh, with you all this morning. Uh, will you pray with me before we dive in? Lord, I pray for the words that I bring this morning. God, may they be yours, and may your word be found in and all through them. Where there is any uh, distraction, will those, we pray that those things would fall away. God, may your words be impactful, and may the things that are, uh, uh, um, may the things that are distracting or drawing our minds away from you, may those be left aside as we draw our hearts closer to you. We lift this all up in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you continue through this uh, Lenten series on prayer, I thought uh, that I might uh, offer you one idea that I hope could serve as a tool in your tool belt when it comes to prayerful and faithful discernment. As I mentioned just a, just a moment ago, that I work as a mental health counselor, and so I often find myself sitting with people as we seek to uncover ideas or, or thoughts or, or strategies that may help them to live increasingly secure and, and fulfilling lives. And something that I often say to those people is, well, I, I don't believe in silver bullets. And, and what I mean by that is, these ideas might work. 
but they also might not. These strategies might work, but we might need to try something else as well. And that's true here, too, for some of the things that I'll talk about today. So as we look through today's scripture, I wonder if what we'll uncover might be helpful for your prayer and your discernment. I want to start by revisiting a familiar prayer that we heard in Matthew chapter 6 this morning. I'll reread just that part of it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Sound familiar? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And for this morning's purposes, I'd like to focus on just one line of that. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you all know the rhythm with which we typically say these words. Your kingdom come, pause. Your will be done, pause. On earth as it is in heaven. But what if we read those words as the one singular cohesive thought that it is? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does it mean that we're asking God for his will to be done on earth just as his will is being done in heaven? Well, for one, it means simply that by our status in creation, simply by our status as a part of creation, you and I have a role to play in enacting God's will. Here's what scripture tells us about how creation enacts God's will here on earth. Isaiah tells us in chapter 55 that the hills and the mountains will cry out. We read some of this in our, in, our, in our call to worship. The hills and the mountains will cry out that the trees will clap their hands and that the plants of the earth will, quote, make a name for the Lord. Jesus himself tells us in Luke chapter 19 that if you and I are silent, even the rocks themselves will cry out in worship of Christ. And Psalm 148 goes even deeper. It says, The sun, moon, stars, waters, sea creatures, and all that crawls on the ground, fire, hail, snow, mist, wind, trees, mountains and hills, beasts, birds, and livestock, and people of every variety, all will praise the name of the Lord. So do you see, simply by our existence within this creation, you and I are endowed with the responsibility of bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So we return to our question. So how do we do it? I think so often that this is where we get hung up. We can essentially wrap our minds around this concept. We're supposed to help build, God, build God's kingdom here on earth. Great, okay, got it. But the moment the rubber hits the road on this, we end up tumbling off into a ditch somewhere. We struggle when it comes to discerning what to do or, or how to do it. We tie ourselves in knots trying to discern the right choice. Which relationship is, is right for me? Which college is right for my education? Is it right to be pro or is it right to be anti? And you can fill in those blanks as you please. Which words will be right? Which direction is right? Which choice is right? And, and when we do this to ourselves, which we so often do, we are essentially replacing the word right with the word correct. And that makes our options feel very slim, doesn't it? Suddenly, we've taken the complexities of relationship and identity and theology, and we've made them objective. Two plus two equals four, right? Correct. But you and I both know that our lives, 
our relationships, and our beliefs about the kingdom of God are rarely so black and white. Our choices are innumerable. You and I are nuanced and complex people who live in a nuanced and complex creation. It can be very difficult to discern what is right. Now, let's take an important pause here for just a moment. Because if, if we go too far down this line of, of complexity and nuance, we will we'll soon run into the ideas of relativism that say, well, there really is no right and wrong. It all depends. But you and I know that there are guiding principles, that there is right and wrong. That ultimately, we will be judged for our words, our thoughts, and our deeds. Matthew 12 reminds us of this. It says that on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. So, so we can't become paralyzed by this unending search for the exact right decision, but... On the other hand, we do need to align ourselves by some standard. So, what's the standard? Well, let's return to our scripture. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our standard. That's where, we, where each of our decisions must begin. It's like we're asking ourselves, so if I'm standing right here, right now, and my destination is the kingdom of God then where might I go next? How might I go? What would come with me and what would I leave behind? I know it's more questions, more and more questions. So then we have to ask ourselves, if we're praying for heaven on earth, well, do we ever get a glimpse at when heaven and earth interact? Well, yes, we do. The book of Revelation gives us exactly that perspective of when heaven and earth meet. Revelation 21 speaks of, quote, a new heaven and a new earth that will one day come to us. And, and when we think of the restoration of God's kingdom here on earth, this is how the book of Revelation paints it out for us. It says this in Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people." And God himself will be with them as their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. So, Revelation paints a picture for us of a future where all shame and all pain have been wiped away, where death is no more, and where God himself dwells with the people. That's what the kingdom on earth will one day look like, and that's what we need to be striving for now. Where have we seen that sort of imagery before? Where have we heard words like that before? Well, if you were listening closely, you may have heard glimpses of this in our first reading from Genesis chapter 1, right here at the very beginning of this creation that we've been speaking about all morning. The first few chapters in the entirety of our scripture describe a perfect an unstained creation where man and woman dwell together with no shame. 
All of their needs are provided for. The world has not yet tasted death. And yes, God himself himself dwells along their sides. Again, this is what we're striving for when we seek God's will on earth as it is in heaven. So, it stands to reason then that we ought to dig in a bit more right here as we ask our question. How do we bring earth, God's will, to earth as it is in heaven? And while I won't make a particular claim about God's decision-making processes regarding the work of creation, I do get the sense that there are some important clues about how he worked and how he assessed the results of his work. And I wonder if those clues might be of support to us as well. So let's look back to God's work of creation. All in the first chapter of Genesis. We see that on the first day of creation, God creates light and dark, night and day. And then on day four, a few days later, he fills those spaces. He organizes them and he gives them order. On the second day of creation, God makes a space and he separates the water and the sky. And then, on day five, just a few days later, he creates birds of the air and fish of the sea to fill those spaces. And on the third day of creation, God separates land from water. And then, on day six, just a few days later, he creates animals of all kinds and humankind to fill those spaces and to care for them. So we do see a sort of logic or reason or thoughtfulness in creation from the very start. Light is created and then it's put in order. The sky and the water are created and then they are filled and sustained. The land is created and then it is filled and cared for. Creation was not some haphazard experimented by a disinterested deity but a thoughtful and loving pursuit by a God who was and is and ever will be present with it. So that's our first clue. When when we seek God's will on earth as it is in heaven, we don't make haphazard and thoughtless decisions. We make decisions lovingly and with dedication. We make decisions that fill and sustain and care for God's kingdom and for God's people. And that takes us right back to where we began. How will I know which decision is the right decision? Well, let's look back into Genesis 1 again for another clue. God creates light. Verse 4 tells us God saw that the light was good. God separates water and land. Verse 10 tells us that God saw that it was good. God creates plant life. And verse 12 tells us that God saw that it was good. Are you picking up on the pattern here? God creates the stars and the sun and the moon. And verse 18 tells us that God saw that it was good. God creates birds of the air and fish of the sea. And verse 21 tells us that God saw that it was good. God creates an array of living creatures. And verse 25 tells us that God saw that it was good. And then finally, he creates us, humankind. He stands back and he looks at it all, the work of his hands. And verse 31 tells us that God saw everything he had made. And behold, it was very good. There's not a single place in all of the story of creation that says, and it was right. Nowhere are we told that God had made something correctly. Instead, we're told that all that he made was good. I wonder how that might impact the decisions that you and I are making. Instead of asking, what's the right thing to do? What if we ask, what choice would be good? 
And not just good in the way that vanilla ice cream or a nice glass of wine is good, but good in the way that creation is good. Sustaining, purposeful, thoughtful, loving, dedicated. Good in the way that the new heaven and the new earth are good, free from shame, in pursuit of life, always dwelling with God. You see, this is how creation was meant to be from the very start. Remember, remember for a moment the name of the tree from which Adam and Eve ate when sin entered the world. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Until that time, until those fateful bites, at the beginning of creation, as God had intended, Adam and Eve, humankind, only knew good. They had only experienced good. In our original divine design from God, you and I were only supposed to know good. Evil is like some sort of malware that has infected our creation. It's not supposed to be there. So if you and I want to build the kingdom, you and I have to build something that is good. Good with a capital G. Good that lasts. So so when we seek God's will on earth as it is in heaven, we have to recognize our responsibility in that work. And then we must create, sustain, and love the work of our hands just as the Creator has done for us. And and if, if in the work of building God's creation... If in, the, or if in the work of building God's kingdom, you find yourself stuck and asking that question, what's the right thing to do? Let me remind you of Romans 8, 28 that says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. You and I must work in all things together for good. Friends, as you go from this place this morning, you are called to seek God's will on earth as it is in heaven. May you seek to build life. May you strive to be dedicated to it. May all that you be driv- do be driven by thought and purpose and love. And may you dwell with God In all that you do, build something good. Amen.
please join with me in the affirmation of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, our creator and redeemer, help us only to desire in our hearts and only to ask in our prayers the things which please you. Help us to ask that we may learn not how to grow rich in this world's goods, but how to lay up treasure in heaven, not how to realize our dreams of worldly greatness, but how to live in humble service. Help us to ask that we may learn not how to live in the independence of pride, but in dependence on you. Not how to know and plan the future, but how to take one step at a time, our hand in yours. Help us to ask that we may learn not how to get our own way, but how to take your way. Not how to do what we want, but how to do what you want. Help us to ask that we may learn not how to gratify, but how to master our desires. Not how to satisfy, but how to tame our passions. Help us to ask that we may learn not how to live as if this world were all, but as pilgrims of eternity who have here no abiding city, but who are on the way to that city, whose maker and builder you are. Not how to please ourselves in this world, but how to meet your judgment when this world is ended. We ask your special blessing this week on Ruth Fecko and Nancy Watson. Help us all to seek your justice and glorify you, knowing that we are always yours. Together, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God's great love for us is so abundant and given so freely to us that our natural response is to return a portion of that bounty to the work of God. Give gladly out of your abundance, rejoicing in the goodness of our God.
Generous and loving God, we thank you for the abundance that enables us to give. We dedicate these gifts to the work of the church, to service to others, and to your everlasting glory. Amen. And my friends, before we go this morning, will you receive a blessing? As you go from this place, go knowing that you have been called to help enact God's will on earth as it is in heaven. Build something good. Build with grace, build with forgiveness, and the love that the Creator has poured onto His creation from the very beginning and will forevermore to come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.